What do you think when you hear the word deliverance? For some people who like movies the way that I do, you think of the 1972 movie by Burt Reynolds. It's an awesome flick. I wasn't supposed to watch it back then, but my grandmother didn't speak English, so I kind of put on whatever I wanted. For some other people, you think of the deliverance ministries that filled the church for years and years and years and all the great tent meetings and all the revivals that people would have. People like Billy Graham and David Wilkerson and R.W. Schambach. And with those things, you saw a great many healings. You saw sometimes demons come out of people. But also with that, you saw a bunch of baggage, good and bad, that was left by God's people. Deliverance has become an ugly word because of the abuse of the good thing the people of God has done to it. When you think of deliverance ministries, you think of the 60 seconds or the, the, the 10 minutes that you see on, on YouTube and on Instagram and on TikTok, things that people become skeptical of and, and things that the media has corrupted and trying to take away the good thing that God has done in some people's lives. Deliverance is a word that needs to come back to God's church. Deliverance is a word that needs to come back to God's church. So let me define it for you this morning because it's very simple. Deliverance is God providing a rescue plan when we are in trouble. That's what deliverance is. Deliverance is God providing a rescue plan when we are in trouble. So anytime that you need something from God, You need deliverance. Anytime that you're dealing with stress and anxiety and the oppression of the enemy, you need deliverance. And after years and years of having deliverance in your life, you will realize that there is always an oppressor that is behind it. Some people say it's the enemy. Other people say it's the world. Other people say it is our own flesh tricking us and manipulating us. I am here to tell you that you have to deal with all three for the rest of your life. But you also have a Savior that gives you and equips you with all the right tools so that not only will you receive deliverance from every instance, that you will receive a rescue plan from every situation, but that you will be free from the oppressor. We're talking about that this morning. As the people of Israel are going forward against an enemy that they were not prepared for. They were prepared to deal with the Philistines. The Bible makes that very, very clear. But they have an enemy in the Ammonites that they were not ready for. Today's message is very simple, church. Deliverance comes by God's grace. And that alone. Deliverance comes... By God's grace. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me in a word of prayer? Father God, we come before you in the mighty and matchless name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you for your sweet and mighty Holy Spirit. Jesus, you are our Savior and our Lord. You are the God that sits between the cherubim. You are the God that was with Abraham, with Moses, with David with Jesus, and now you are with us. And just as you have rescued them, you will rescue your children. You will give us deliverance. God, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hands and feet to respond to your message. Hide your servant behind the cross. And may Jesus Christ be high and lifted up today. Amen. And amen. We've been in the book of 1 Samuel for a while now, and last week we talked about how our choices come with consequence. How Saul was anointed as king, and even though he was anointed as king a week in advance, he was still hiding with the baggage when the people of Israel found out that he was going to be king. Didn't display a good sign in the beginning. But as the story goes, everybody went home to their own territory. Even Saul went back to farming the field. 
because there was no palace. There was no castle. He was a person just like everybody else. He went back doing what he did before he was anointed. Now, there is an issue that is happening. Saul's first issue as king. The western region, which we all know about, we talk about it today, we call it the West Bank, was filled with this people called the Philistines. And when Saul was first anointed, he had said that God would deliver the people from the Philistines, which is everybody on the west, west side. Oh, we got the map. Great. I'm so excited. You guys know how much I love maps. Okay. So everybody was concerned with everyone west of the Mediterranean. That's what they were preoccupied about. But what happened was the Ammonites, which live in the northeastern region, started oppressing and attacking the people of Israel, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad. And if you look up in the upper corner right there, that is Jabesh Gilead. What happened was that the tribes of Reuben, the tribes of Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh was being attacked by these Ammonites and their king to the point where all the able warriors started being attacked and 7,000 people ran to Jabesh Gilead because it was the only city that was still encased in walls that could give them protection. That is what the Israelites are facing right now. This is the first test for Saul and the monarchy. It is the first test for the king. Is he going to live up to his new role? And is the anointing of the Spirit of God that was given to him and confirmed with many signs going to live up to its expectations? For Israel, are they going to... Support their king. Support the one that the Lord has brought to them. And for us in this story, will we trust the king of kings and the Lord of lords to deliver us in our time of need? There are plenty of times where we read the stories in the Bible and sometimes we look at them as folklore. They're not. They are historical accounts from mighty men and women of God written for you and me so that we have solutions to our problems. And the ultimate solution is turn to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. We will be victorious if we look up rather than looking to the left and to the right for our solutions. Deliverance comes by God's grace and his grace alone. And church, grace hears our cries. Grace hears our cries. 1 Samuel 11, starting in verse 1. Now Nahash the Ammonite went up to besiege Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to him, make a treaty with us. We will be subjects to you. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of everyone so that you will bring disgrace on all of Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, give us seven days so we can send messengers throughout Israel. If no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. There is an old piece of paper or pieces of paper called the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were uh, documents that were left by the Essenes. And I'm going to summarize it. It basically sometimes filled in the extra stories or the history that the Bible leaves out. Not for poor and bad reasons, but because the Bible is not a history book the way that we would read it. The Bible is showing us examples of how we achieve victory and God's ultimate victory plan. It wasn't looking for uh, uh, this person had 7,000 bullets in his regiment and 12,000. That's what a historian would do. They would write everything down in precise calculation. That's what we would do. The Bible doesn't do that. The Bible gives us instructions on how we are to live in this modern day world. And according to these documents, the reason why 7,000 men were already in Jabesh Gilead is because all the other warriors had their right eye gouged out, which means that they were impaired. 
That means they couldn't fight in the Lord's army anymore with Israel. That means they couldn't fight anybody else's battle anymore. And out of the three major tribes that would normally go go to war and call everyone to each other, there was only 7,000 left. And they were thousands and thousands with the Ammonites. They felt helpless. And church, let me tell you, Jabesh, this city, was technically not worth saving. They were technically getting what they deserved. Early on in the book of Judges, the Bible talks to us about how a Levite had a piece of property that was taken from them and was abused. And he called on all the tribes of Israel to be able to help and bring justice. And Jabesh Gilead said, it's not our problem. We're going to stay out of it. When the Lord's word had said, whenever anyone calls for justice in all of Israel, everyone is to come together and everyone is to participate. In the same way that when you and me and our brothers and sisters are feeling hurt and abused and mistreated and feel injustice, we are not supposed to have one person come to them. We are not supposed to have one person visit them or one person pray for them. We should have an army of prayer warriors that should be interceding on their behalf. We should have so many people that are ready to take up arms and storm the gates of hell so that our brothers and sisters can be delivered. But Jabesh didn't do that. So technically, they would be getting what they deserved. They would be reaping what they sowed. But instead, God heard their cry. Even before they sent out messengers, God heard their cry. They were desperate enough that they would cry out to all of their brothers and sisters and say, forgive us and come and rescue us. Will you all band together and come to our rescue? Hear our cry and hear our plea, for there is no leader in this place that we can be able to call on. And the king of kings used his servant in a mighty way that we will talk about in soon enough. When was the last time that you cried out to God? When was the last time that you were desperate for victory? I don't think it coincidence that the Holy Spirit asked us to be all in this morning. I do not. I think it is because we are so used to the formula of our prayers. We are so used to the formulas of our Bible reading. We are so used to the formula of our devotions that sometimes the people of God become callous because it is a routine. Well, let me tell you something this morning. morning. Your formula doesn't work in times of desperation. There are other fellowships who have a confessional booth and they they go to a priest and they claim people, uh, they say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Anybody heard that before? There is nothing wrong with being able to go to confession. But what is wrong is being able to say, well, say 10 Hail Marys and five Our Fathers and you'll be okay. The formula doesn't work in times of desperation. When we are desperate before God, our knees have to be down at an altar. We have to say, God, it doesn't matter what convention, what formula I was following. I need you. I need your victory. And I need your plans in Jesus' name. Send the Holy Spirit because I am so desperate. I don't know where else to go. There is difference between crying out. And some of you might say, Pastor, I am really a a, a soft prayer. I am really a a, a prayer that that does it internally. When me and and God talk, we talk internally. Let me tell you, there's no problem. God can be able to touch anybody no matter if they're shouting and no matter if they're sitting. In fact, I can display that in my own relationship. When the Holy Spirit moves, I jump. When, uh, When the Holy Spirit moves, Vanessa sits down. Because that's how God has wired us. That is how God has created us. I'm saying what your heart condition is. Are you fully looking for victory? Or are you just looking for a temporary fix? For God to get you out of a situation that he is using to shape you. 
You might be in the middle of a storm and you say, God, why am I in the middle of this? Because he wants to shape you. Because he wants to form you into an image that is worth more than gold. Sometimes you have to go through the fire because it is when you go through the fire that you can be able to meet Jesus. Be like the three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and say, King, we will not bow down to your statue, and if you throw us in the fire, our God will rescue us. Where are the people of God who are desperate enough to cry out for the Lord Almighty because he will deliver them? Let me remind you what it says in Psalm 34, 17. It says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from their times of trouble. And Psalm 145, 18 says, the Lord is near to all who call on him. To some who call on him? No, to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. That is in true desperation. That is in true relationship with him. And look what it says in verse 19. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him or those who respect him. He hears their cry and he saves them. Isn't our God good? Sometimes we need personal testimonies. So your pastor didn't have this in his notes, but I'm going to say it anyway. Believe it or not, when I was younger... I wasn't as bold as I am now. I was a scrawny little kid, probably 75 pounds soaking wet, when I was diagnosed with chronic anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. It haunted me for years. For years. Because I thought that I had to be perfect. Because I thought that I had to be in control. Because I thought that if I messed up, that the burden of my family would fail. Being the oldest child in a single parent home and having siblings that were close in age, younger than me, and also being the oldest grandchild, so Thomas was in charge of sometimes 15 to 20 kids at a time, I felt like I had to be the example for everyone. And because of that, I would take the world on my shoulders. I would get straight A's, but I would be broken inside. So much to the point that my anxiety attacks got so bad that I would hyperventilate to the point where I would pass out and I would end up in the hospital sometimes for days at a time. I struggled with that burden for six years. I hated being helpless. And I didn't know how to stop it. There were plenty of people who gave me advice and counsel There were plenty of people who prayed for me, but I didn't realize how free I could be in Jesus Christ yet. I didn't realize how much he wanted to love me and take away my pain and my hurt and my stresses. And I confess to you this morning, church, that I was in my room, and the enemy tried to do the same thing to me this morning. For the first time in years, I felt helpless. I felt like I needed to be in control. I felt like the world was pressing down on my chest. But I have someone. (laughs) But I have someone who I can be able to turn to. And you know what he said? He said, you text everybody that you have in your phone. And you say, pray for me. And at an instant, 20 people at the drop of a hat started texting me back saying, I got you. Don't worry. I'm here for you. I'm crying out with you. And as I am pouring out to God in my room before praying with you this morning, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit drops a nugget in my head and said, he tried to take you today. 
He tried to take you today because there is something that needs to be accomplished this morning. Somebody needs to hear this message this morning. And my sadness and my anxiety and my pressure turned into anger and upsetness. Why? Because he tried to steal my victory. He tried to steal my glory. He tried to steal the deliverance that God was giving to me and that he wanted to give to you this morning. God is the God of victory. And my sadness and my anxiety turned into righteous anger and I said devil you are not going to win this morning you are not going to have the victory this morning my lord and my savior is the one that directs my path even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me are you desperate for him this morning are you, are, cry, are you crying out to him? Because he wants to hear you. He wants to hear you. There are times where we think that as Christians, we have gotten to a point of maturity where we can be able to figure it out on our own. We can't. We need to cry out to God. Because before you were a Christian, you were his child. And never forsake being a mature, or never forsake being a child of God to be a mature Christian. I would rather be a child. Because with the heart of a child, that is when I enter into the kingdom of heaven. Deliverance comes by God's grace. There is one book that I will recommend to you before I move on. It is this little book that I have looked at very, very fondly since I received it. It's called The Power of Crying Out. There is no secret formula in this book. It is just a reminder from the author that God wants to hear our cries of desperation and that he hears and that he answers. What victory do you need this morning? Deliverance comes by God's grace. And grace not only hears our cry, but grace delivers a solution. Grace delivers a solution. 1 Samuel 11, starting in verse 4. When the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. Just then Saul was returning from the field behind his oxen, and he asked, What is wrong with everyone, and why are they weeping? Then they repeated to him what the men of Jabesh said. When Saul heard their word, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent the pieces to messengers throughout Israel. Proclaim, this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they came together as one when Saul mustered them at Bezek. The men of Israel numbered 300,000. And those of Judah, 30,000. They told the messengers who had come, say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, by this time, the sun is hot tomorrow. You will be rescued. When the messengers went and reported this, the men of Jabesh were elated. Grace delivers a solution. God's solution for the people of Israel at this time was for King Saul to help deliver them. He did a reversal, and instead of how the people of Jabesh sent no one to help their brothers in advance, God sent an army of 300,000 led by a king who was filled with the spirit and filled with righteous anger. The same anger 
that gave Jesus the power to flip over the tables in the temple when the money changers were trying to use the temple for ill purposes rather than it being a house of prayer and a house of sacrifice. It is that same rage that God filled Saul with. God's solution could only come through Saul, not through Samuel. In the first half of our stories that we have been going through, the first half of God's word in 1 Samuel, we talked about how Samuel would utter the words, how Samuel would bring victory to the people, how Samuel would do all of this. But Samuel couldn't work in this time because God had created a new thing. God had created a new hope in Saul, and God anointed Saul to be the overseer of the armies, to be the deliverer of the people of Israel that was filled with with God's Holy Spirit. I am here to tell you this morning, when it comes to the solutions of this world and our problems, God is not looking for a previous ministry. God is not looking for a previous victory. God is not looking for a previous anointing. He is calling his church to get on their knees and be filled with fresh wind, fresh fire, and fresh anointing. That is what he has called us to. Stop looking in the past for the old thing. That's not going to get you to it. God is going to create a new thing in you, and it's going to be more glorious. It's going to be more faithful to what you have at hand now. So stop looking in the past. Stop looking at, oh, if we can get back to there, I want to get where God wants me to be. I don't want to look in the past. Some of those people are gone. We are no longer in another address, Brother Dave. We are no longer in the other address. We're no longer in that Bethel. We're here in this Bethel. We are no longer in the old basement. We're in the new basement. We are no longer in the old worship. We're in this worship. This is what God has called us to. And his church are called to be salt and light to the earth. So stop looking for the old and start looking for the new. Because solutions for us will come through God's grace. And his solutions don't look conventional. His solutions look like a peanut butter and pickle sandwich. Exactly. Every single one of them. You're like, what the hell is that way? I don't eat peanut butter and pickle sandwiches. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, you see how you guys cringed? In the same way, God will give you the solution and say, well, that doesn't look good. Why would you want me to do that? Because you will come out whole, perfect, and refined. God wants us to do the unconventional. What does Jesus tell us to do? He says, hey, when your enemy wants you to walk a mile, do me a favor, go walk another one. When the enemy wants to sue you for your shirt, give them your whole tunic. When your enemy wants to slap you and fill you with disrespect, turn the other cheek. That's what Jesus tells you. He tells you to do the opposite of what would be logical in this world. And these solutions, church, require trust. They require faith, sometimes blind faith. Sometimes we will be like Peter and have to walk on the water and keep our eyes on Jesus. And here's another thing, church. The solution doesn't look the same every time. The solution doesn't look the same every time. But some of y'all, including me, will wear basketball equipment to the middle of a football game and say, well, this worked in the past. I might as well, you know, it, it got me ready for that game. Maybe it'll get me ready for this game. And you got devils, demons, this world, and your flesh in football pads getting ready to truck you. I don't, I don't know what the biblical word for truck is. I'm from the inner city. Boof. That's all I know. Solutions don't look the same. The apostle Peter, when Jesus first called him, he was casting nets. What that means is that he was going fishing and he was bringing it in. Doesn't that sound like Peter? He goes out on Pentecost 
and he goes and he casts and he brings in 3,000. But you know what John did? John was right in the next verse. If you look in the book of Matthew, John and, and James were in the next verse. They were mending their nets. And what does John do in 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John? He mends people. He heals people. And God says, you need both solutions to be able to accomplish becoming a disciple and making disciples. For every John, for every Peter, for every Paul, it's a new solution that you and I need. And it looks different every single time, but all of it will bring victory in Jesus' name. I am so excited that the people of this church don't have to listen to my solutions. They have to listen to our solutions. We are the ones that will bring the solutions. Through the Holy Spirit, he will give us all different perspectives and all different ways in order for everyone to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ and for everyone to receive deliverance in the way that he or she needs. But will you take up arms, church? Will you get ready for battle? Will you be like the 300,000 that have such a respect for God and such a love for his people that you would sacrifice your own safety, your protection, and your trust in your own life to reach out to broken men and women, to reach out to broken young people, to reach out to those in the universities and in the hospitals and those in government and politics who says that left is right. We live in a crooked world, and the only thing that can be able to be made straight through it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we have the solution, and sometimes we leave it here. Sometimes we keep it here. We hold it, and we put it in a box, and we say, oh, I don't want anybody to touch my light or my solution. And we get hard. And we're less open. And as Brother David said, our time, our talents, and our treasures, we keep to us and we bury it. You know what God says to that in his word? He says, you lazy and wicked servant. Don't do that. Your deliverance is supposed to be shared. Your stories are supposed to be shared. They're called testimonies. And when your stories are shared... And when you receive victory, you know what the Holy Spirit does? He is fruitful and multiplies. And all of a sudden, a church of 100 people becomes a church of 1,000 people. And I declare in Jesus' name that those walls, I said it last year, those walls are going to come down. And this will be a church of hundreds of people. Not so that we feel good so that lost, dying, and hurting people become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Amen. We must accept the solutions that God has delivered. And it's like building a muscle, church. As we work out, as we work on ourselves day by day, we will see new resistance that comes. And we're waging a war back and forth. But what does the Apostle Paul say? It's not in your notes. It's just from my devotions and the Holy Spirit speaking to me right now. He says, I train so that I might not be disqualified for the prize. And he says, physical training is essential, but training for godliness is better. Deliverance comes by God's grace. Grace hears our cries, and grace delivers a solution. And grace comes when we don't deserve it. Grace comes when we do not deserve it. 1 Samuel 11, 11. The next day, Saul separated his men into three divisions. During the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered so that not two of them were left together. 
The people then said to Samuel, Who was it that asked, Shall Saul reign over us? Turn these men over, so that we may put them to death. If you guys remembered in our story last week, there were men that questioned God's calling of the king. What I didn't tell you is that Saul kept silent. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't angry. Because the Lord is the judge. And he brings justice. Verse 13 tells us, But Saul said, No one will be put to death today. For this day, the Lord has rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord, and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. Musicians, if you would come. The Bible calls them in 1 Samuel 10 troublemakers. That they were people that were stirring up the people. The same type of people that stir up God's people all the time. The book of 1st and 2nd. Mira, aquí. Tú tienes ojo, mira, aquí. Ellos no, no están haciendo nada. They're not doing anything. Here. God is speaking to you this morning. They're just getting ready to do their part. There were troublemakers. There always are troublemakers. The book of 1 Timothy calls them busybodies and gossips. People who believe in myths and old wives' tales. People who have the idea of godliness but deny its power. People who want to stir up trouble and have an argument over everything. These were the people that Saul was dealing with. You know what he said? The Lord will bring the victory. In his silence, he said, God will answer. And instead of doing what they deserved the consequences that they deserved. They deserved divine punishment. Because basically in questioning Saul, they were questioning God and his choice for his people. And you know what Saul did? He didn't give them divine punishment. He gave them divine grace. The word grace is a free gift. It can only be given by God and through God and his people. We would never give grace. We would take vengeance. The whole reason why an eye for an eye was made in the Bible was not because it was an equal thing. It was God saying, there needs to be a stop because you guys will slaughter each other. And look at our society today, in constant war with each other, constantly taking sides, constantly taking fits, dividing not only the people of this world, but even God and his church. God doesn't, God isn't double-minded. He will not be mocked. And if he is not double-minded, then his church shouldn't be either. We should be of one body and one spirit, one power and one might. Grace comes when we don't deserve it. The troublemakers received grace and all of them celebrated the great victory that happened. All of them had fellowship offerings. All of them had a great party that said, look what the Lord has done. We're getting ready to do that too in a little bit. But we got to go to war first. Because there's some deliverance that some of us need. 
There's a miracle that some of us has been waiting for. Today is when that miracle is going to happen. God asked if you were all in at the beginning of the service. He's still asking, are you all in right now? Because he was. Because church, we were the troublemakers. We were the troublemakers. We should have been punished. We do not deserve the love of God. We do not deserve his mercy and his grace and the fellowship that we have with brothers and sisters here. And yet, he loves us and he called us. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 says it like this. You guys can be able to relate probably. As for you, you were dead in your sins and your transgressions in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. Jesus, at just the right time, at just the right point in time, he came to deliver us from all of our sin, from all of our brokenness, from all of our hurt. And he said, don't you take it up anymore. It is not yours to be able to take. It was mine. I took it through my hands. I took it through my feet. I took it through every lashing. I took it through the shedding of my blood. And I took it when I resurrected from the grave three days later. And it has no existence in you because I see nothing but my perfect and wonderful spotless children it is by grace ye have been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing Jesus is still interceding on our behalf for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all people this has now been witnessed to you at the proper time. Today is the proper day. Today is the proper time. Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and he pierced himself so that you can be made whole. You were not told to walk in brokenness. You were told to walk in victory. You are a sinner saved by grace who has become a saint and a prince and a princess of the Most High God. You have a spot with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, so stop looking at yourself as less than. Stop looking at yourself as 50% in. God wants you all the way in because he did it all for you. But will you receive the rescue this morning? Do you want to be rescued? Some of you say yes and others of you are so reserved because you say Pastor Thomas, you don't know my story. You don't know what sins I have committed. Oh, if I sat you down and gave you my testimony, there was a bunch of red in my ledger. There was a bunch of debts that I owed, Jesus as my savior or not. There were plenty of times where I was his child and I messed up just like Israel. You know what his word says? By his stripes, I am healed. And though your sins be as scarlet, he will make them white as snow. God has purified you 
through his blood, through his sacrifice, and through his resurrection. Will you take it this morning? Will you accept it this morning? For those who have been living in his righteousness, take the reminder to fall at his feet because your heavenly father does not condemn you for being imperfect. Shakira has reminded me, we are imperfect people, (laughs) teaching imperfect people how to connect with a perfect God. But will you take the charge this morning, church? The worship team is going to play a song. It is a very familiar song. It's one of my favorites. Will you accept his rescue plan for you? Will you take the deliverance that he has given you? This is what we're going to do. Everyone who needs deliverance, you come to this altar. Everyone who needs deliverance, you come to this altar because you need to make it right with God. I do too. We will all come. And for my brothers and sisters who are a little bit more mature, my deacons, my elders, (laughs) their spouses, if you can help me after you respond to the call of God this morning in laying hands on people, Nana, could you do me a favor and get me the rest of the anointing oil that I have in my office? We're going to pray out any demon, any principality in Jesus' name. For those who, have phys- who need physical healing, we're going to pray for that as well. Because God is the God of victory and the God of deliverance. And his people will not be broken. He will not be broken for a lack of him trying. But we need to respond. Join the worship team. The Spirit says come, and the altars are open.